going to get underway again. So if you're by the door, you might want to come and either take a seat or, or head out. Come sit. Oh, okay. Kevin, the other thing you said on your, on your blog was that you were, um, two years ago, you were surprised how infrequently you were asked for selfies. So if this isn't self-indulgent, just, can we? Let's get the seat and get around. That's going to be famous. That's a keeper. That That's is. a keeper. Okay, good. Uh, first question, someone asks, uh, Broncos or Panthers? That's, uh, that is important. Uh, how, do people here even care about the Super Bowl? I have no idea. A few, yeah, they do? You're going to stay up? Yeah, tomorrow? Okay. Uh, I don't really have a dog in that fight. I uh, was born in Chicago. I'm a Chicago Bears fan. They haven't been good for about 30 years. But uh, I kind of want the Broncos to win because I'd like to see Peyton get one more ring before he hangs it up. I, I think that Carolina is going to win, though. That's my prediction. 27-24. There you go. I'm nodding. I haven't got a clue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, more importantly, someone asks, or a couple of people actually have asked, what does holiness mean? Can you give us a, a, a bit more definition on that? On mm, that subject? Yeah, that is really good because I talked about holiness and I didn't quite define it. There, uh, I have several other sermons that talk about that. Th there are a lot of ways. You can think about just the term itself, which... Uh, means separation or to be set apart. So God is holy because he is unlike us. So holiness is to be set apart from the world. You can think of it spatially with that analogy. Uh, you can think of holiness as the Ten Commandments, give a summary of God's moral law. Uh, you can think of it as the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, you can look at the various virtue and vice lists in the New Testament. There are several of those, and it's very instructive to go through. You just get sort of an ad hoc list of what does virtue look like, and as many of the same things. What do vices, what does worldliness look like? Ultimately, of course, uh, the answer to the question is not a list, but a person. Uh, we're, we're being renewed, Ephesians 4 says, in the image of Christ, who is in the image of the invisible God. So really, to, to what is holiness, the best answer is, who is holiness? And it's to look like Jesus. Someone else asked, is it the same as godliness? Yeah, I think they're used as synonyms in the New Testament. Okay. Um, okay, someone else asks, you just made, made brief reference to it there, are the Ten Commandments still rules for holiness? As some of you may be aware, there, there are Christians can look at the Ten Commandments in different ways. And some of them, some people say, that they all are obligations for Christians unless they're explicitly rescinded in the New Testament. Some say, well, they're not for Christians unless they're explicitly re-upped in the New Testament or people have various opinions in between. Um, as, a, as a Reformed Christian, I'll give you what my understanding, and I, and I hope that it's biblical. I do think that the Ten Commandments t continue to reveal to us God's moral will for our lives. Uh, the, the one that, you know, there's it maybe seems the trickiest is the one on the Sabbath. I do think the, the Old Testament Sabbath was a shadow, but I think there's an abiding principle of the Lord's Day and resting one day in seven and what it means to enter into that Sabbath rest. And I say that not just because, well, that's what people in my tradition say, but because you have Paul in Romans 13, when he starts talking about loving God, he goes on to talk about obeying the commandments. How do you love God? You obey these commandments. And if you're obeying these commandments, you are fulfilling the law of love. And Jesus himself said, if you love me, you what? You have really amazing worship experiences. No, that's not what he said. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. You can look at uh, 1 Timothy 1, where Paul talks, goes through, and he's, he's obviously going through the second table of the law as he unpacks uh, various things that lawless people do. So 
there are a number of occasions in the New Testament where Jesus or the apostles, in wanting to give their description of what holiness looks like, lean on the Ten Commandments as the way of providing a general outline for that. Again, this follows on, I think. Someone says, um, doesn't the Bible say we're not under law anymore? Yes and no. Uh, I would say we are not under law as a, as a national covenant like Israel was under the Mosaic Covenant. We are certainly not under law as any sort of salvation by law keeping. So you can, you can go back and forth. And I, I do think the question of the law in the Christian life may be the most complicated, certainly requiring the most nuance of really theological questions because you find Paul on the one hand uh, seeming to say the, the law was just a tutor to lead us to Christ. We're done with the law. On the other hand, he says, no, but the law is, is good and it's holy and it's right. And he will quote from the law. So I think we are not under the law as a national covenant. We're not under the law in any sort of way of uh, meriting salvation. Neither were the Israelites for that matter. But uh, the law still has, and the Westminster Confession says, either in explicit commands or the, or it uses the phrase, or the general equity thereof, which means even if you go to the Old Testament law and you have a command like, in the Old Testament says you're supposed to put a, a parapet, a fence around your roof. Well, I've looked around at a lot of roofs here, very few of them have fences. Are you all being disobedient? I don't think so because the, the abiding moral principle there is in the ancient Near East where people went out on the roof as a as a way to get cool in the evening and as a sort of patio, it was loving your neighbor to put a fence there so people didn't plummet to their death. So that's what you do. So I think the abiding moral principle is you look out to serve your neighbor and that's why you have various uh, codes with buildings and things. So I, I, yes, the law still matters. I think the law is still for the Christian, not only to reveal sin, but also to point us in the path of righteousness. Um, someone asks, our godliness must be grounded in the gospel. Paul says, it's not I, but the grace of God mm -hmm. in me. Uh, what does that actually feel like? Uh, when I'm doing something, it feels like it's me going through the motions. What, is, what, uh, what does Paul mean experientially there, do you think? Yeah, I, I am a firm believer in, uh, in desire experiential Christianity. At the same time, I... I fear that we, we can ask questions that would have been very foreign to Paul. I, I do think sometimes on the, whether it comes from Hegel with synthesis, antithesis, thesis, or it comes from Kant with Neumann phenomena, or whether it, it comes from Freud with a, you know, an, an ego and a, you know, things that we're doing and a subconscious, I think that Going through the motions sounds to us like a very bad thing, and it could be, and yet it could also be a sign of maturity. You know, hypocrisy is not doing something when you don't feel like it. That's actually called maturity. It's called being an adult. Uh, hypocrisy is when you say one thing and do another, or you claim to have one set of principles and then you live out by another set. So I understand, I hear the heart of the question that we could just be falling into a bad rut as a Christian. And yet I want to say there's good ruts and there's, there's bad ruts. And so I'm not sure that we will often experientially be able to detect, I feel like this is 40% in the spirit and this is 30% in the flesh. And it's like, you know, 25% British or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that... Uh, we do the right thing, we put off the old man, we put on the new, and God is pleased when we walk in obedience. And, you know, I think of our life is it's like a rubber band that stretches and pulls and snaps back, and sometimes you're going to have parts in your Christian life where the affective element, the experiential element, is stretching here, and, and your actual obedience is back here. That's what university students are often like and then it snaps forward, and then you're gonna have times where you're just kind of doing it and trying to be a mature Christian is up here, and your emotional, affective life is back here, and it's, and it's gonna do some of that, and I think that's very normal in the Christian life. 
um, can I push you a little harder on this because it, it's helpful Please. stuff. And um, what you were saying at the end in terms of um, setting the promises of God before us, eliciting desire for the promises rather than the promises of sin, um, is great and very persuasive. But what what happens when I don't feel those desires welling up in my heart, but I know that there's a there's a sin in my life? How did when the heart feels cold, how do I pursue godliness? Mm -hmm. I think that's why it, it is called the fight of faith. It is a fight to believe those great and precious promises, to believe the things. I mean, the, the Bible is trying to motivate us in a thousand different ways to godliness. So I don't know if this answers the question, but I, I would just look for in your daily Bible reading, we, we, we flatten the biblical text so that we think, well, the only real motivation is gratitude, or the only motivation is to, to get used to my justification, when there are just tons of ways that the Bible wants to get at our heart and at our emotions, uh, appealing to the love of neighbor, and the example that, that we'll set, uh, appealing to the glories of heaven, appealing to the dangers of, of hell, appealing to our own satisfaction. So I think it's in an intentional study of those promises that we stir up those affections. And I, and I intentionally use the word affections. If any of you know of Jonathan Edwards' book, Religious Affections, or you've you know, maybe read John Piper, who has you know, popularized a lot of Edwards, he purposely used affections differently. We equate it with emotions, but he doesn't mean it as the same way. It doesn't, there's, there was a, a philosophical distinction between passions and affections. Um, the Westminster Confession says God is without parts and passions. And people sometimes say, whoa, 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 what is that? I don't like God without passion. Because we think of passion as, yes, passion. Passion was thought to be something in which you are passive, in which something sweeps over you. And in that sense, uh, you know, often we think of emotions that way. They just come and they sweep over us. That's not what Edwards meant by affections. Affections are an inclination. And so I hear in some of these questions, and I think Christians are looking for passions in that passive sense. Why can't I get these things that used to sweep over me, and I want them to sweep over me again? And I don't think we have a promise that, that they will. Uh, and that's why it says God is without passions, because he is never acted upon. He is always the supreme actor. But affections, desires, inclinations, while there is an overlap with our understanding of emotion, I think it's, it's richer than that. So that Lewis, for example, says, when you desire to have a desire, that is in itself the right desire. So even coming before God, and saying, I mean, the Lord knows, I've prayed all sorts of prayers, I'm not sure I really mean them when I pray them. I mean, really. Lord, I'm praying this, because I know you want me to pray this. I don't feel this. It's like Augustine saying, Lord, give me chastity, but not quite yet, was his famous prayer, before he was converted. And so I think, I, I think to pray something as a desire for a right desire is pleasing to God, and is an indication, perhaps not of the emotion that we'd like to have, but of the right inclination and affection. So we, we could do well to not be so caught up in the moment by moments and think of these desires as medium to long-term projects as we go to work on our hearts with God's word. Yes, ab absolutely. And our propensity, uh, and I think it's, it's the younger we are, the more we have that tendency, is to focus in the now, what am I doing? How am I feeling? I felt great two weeks ago. I'm not feeling this. I felt close to God. Now I don't feel close to God. And the testimony of, of almost all the great saints in history are, you know, there's times of feeling barren. There's times of feeling dry. That doesn't mean we don't pursue after God and plead with him in that to change our experience of it. But the experience of it is not in itself the measure of obedience. Okay, let's come back to some of these questions. Um, in reference to the passage you were looking at this evening particularly, the writer to the Hebrews talks a lot about discipline in that passage. What's that about? How does God, God's discipline lead to holiness? It's so, it's so dangerous to answer that because I think it's difficult to apply personally. You, you have, in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, or 1 Corinthians 11, um, Paul says that some people have 
taken the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, and that's why some of you are sick and some have died. Now, just think about that. There may be people sick in your church because they took the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. We, we, don't, we don't think like that. And I say it's dangerous because then everyone right now who's like, <coughs> <laughs> it's allergies, you know, because I, I don't at all want to say that there's a one-to-one -one correlation, but I do think we, we probably don't think of the possibility of even those. So all that to say, I think the Lord might discipline us with, with uh, illness, and I just want you to hear me, I don't, I'm not equating at all people who are illness or anything with discipline. I just think it's a category. Uh, I think whenever there is suffering, it's an opportunity that the Lord is inviting us to repent of any sins. So I think there's that. Uh, I think we can certainly receive the Lord's discipline through other believers. Uh, through the preaching of God's word, we may sense this is God giving me a rebuke. We, we, we are meant to hear it through our friends and through our church family, that sort of discipline. There may be ways in which he, uh, he blocks our path, you know, as he did with Balaam on the donkey to, to discipline us and get us where he wants to go. It, it is very ordinary and it is very mysterious at the same time. And it's a great question. And I don't have an entirely satisfying answer. And, and when, when we talk about discipline, we can hear the word punishment as behind that, that word. Can you just clarify the distinction yeah, but, and why it's important? It's coming from a father, not from a tyrant, not from the judge. God is a judge. Oh, this answer was too long. No. <laughs> Sorry. Long story. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, a, f a father. We, 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 I mean, the, the same root word, discipleship, discipline. It, it, it's loving correction. That's what the Hebrews 12 was. It, if I don't go around disciplining everyone's children. That would be really annoying. <laughs> because they're not my children. But if I didn't discipline my children, I would be a terrible father. If they say, Daddy, I'm going to get in the bath with toasters... Right ho, you know. Um, that's not loving. You might say, well, that's very unconditional love. No, that's stupid. And a, a loving father discipline. So it is an expression. We, Calvin has this uh, phrase, I think, in his commentary. He said, God, while, while not at all jeopardizing our status in him, can be wondrously angry with his children. Wondrously angry angry, displeased, the Holy Spirit grieved, but as a parent, one who the relationship is not in jeopardy. It's not like I disown you. Um, so our union with Christ is fixed and firm. Our communion with Christ can be sweeter, richer, um, ebb, flow. Like a marriage, you don't wake up one day and say, I think I'll be half married today. No, you're married, but the marriage can be strong, it can be weak. And so it's, it's recovering that dynamic sense of relationship with God. Uh, okay, lots of practical questions which are very helpful. So here's the first. Um, when do I know that I'm actually repentant of my sin and not just regretful of it, like Esau, I guess? I think that the proof, the proof is in the pudding. I think um, turning from it. Repentance means to, to turn. Uh, John the Baptist, his message is to... Uh, Repent and show forth fruit in keeping with repentance. So I think when there is a hatred for it and a turning from it, and again, this is very subtle. We deal with this all the time, and I do as a pastor. You know, someone commits multiple affairs and they're very broken and very grieved. And on the one hand, you, you don't want to punish them and say, okay, well, you're sorry for it. Um, Give me a year and prove it. No, you, you want to, the Lord can forgive, the Lord can heal. And, and yet there is at the same time, while the Lord is, is pleased with that contrition, let's see what happens now in the next few months. And so we're not going to rush you back to, to full membership or whatever the case may be. So I think the sign of, of true repentance is that you're no longer walking that way, but you're, you're walking that way. 
Do you find it's helpful setting rules when striving for holiness, or does that make you think legalistically? Both. I, I think you, you can't do uh, without rules. Now, if you're setting uh, extra biblical rules, if you're saying, here's what the Bible says, uh, you know, the Bible says to be pure. The Bible says not to lust. So I'm going to set a rule that, uh, that Christians should not watch TV, Christians should not go to movies. You, you may feel like, you know, you're just not interested, you don't, that's fine for you. Once you set that rule and you begin to, you know, sort of tell about it to everyone else and how amazing it is, and then you start to look down on people for not having that rule, then you've set the sort of rules that are legalistic and are unhelpful because they're going beyond what is written. But if you say, I'm going to be a Christian, I'm going to have a dynamic relationship with God, and I don't have to worry about rules, then you just, that's not biblical. Jesus says, if you love me, you obey my commandments. You, you can't go to your wife after cheating on her, and she's furious, and she's brokenhearted, and you say, but honey, it's about the relationship, not the rules. <laughs> she would say, the rules are there to protect and promote the relationship. You do not care about this relationship in the way you should if you ignore the rules. So we, we, we can't separate the rules from the relationship. Uh, we're going to go for about 10 more minutes, just uh, so people know. Uh, someone asks, um, where is that one? Uh, is it worth me, after hearing your talk, why should I pay six pounds for holding our holiness? Will you expand on anything you said? <laughs> I think that question itself is evidence of great striving after godliness, frugality. <clears throat> I think that's a charitable understanding of the yeah, question. Yeah, that's right. I think... Uh, I don't know if it's worth six pounds, but yes, there are many other chapters. What I gave you is basically the, the introduction to the book and to the problem, and then the rest of it is how we pursue the means of grace and how union with Christ comes into play and what holiness looks like and how holiness is possible and how we make progress. So I'm, I, don't, say, I don't know if six pounds by worth, the book, but... <laughs> no, by the book, six pounds is a steal. It's worth every penny. Um, how does one break habitual sin? Can you reach heaven without breaking habitual sin? First thing I would say is I think we all, we all have more addictions than we realize. When I talk to people who have you know, what we would think is obvious addictions to pornography or to alcohol, and, and those aren't my addictions, and yet I think how hard it is for me to not constantly look at my phone, how, how, why am I doing this again? And it's not sinful necessarily, but I sympathize with, I don't want to be doing this, and why am I scrolling through this again? Why am I looking at this? Why aren't I reading it? As, as I heard somebody say, Facebook was invented to remind us all that we really do have time to read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so my first part of that is to sympathize that we're more like that than we're not. And in fact, uh, our biblical counselor at our church is, is really good, and, and he often say to me, I mean, the, the start of being a good counselor is to realize you're much more like the one that you're helping than you're not. Soon as you think that, I'm not like this struggler, I'm not like this sinner, I'm not like this person with an addiction, then you're, you're on the path towards a, a haughty sort of legalism. But I think to get to the, to the heart of the question, I do think there are occasions when Christians, Christians make many fewer breakthroughs than they would like to see and than we would like to see. I do think there are Christians who die drunk, having struggled, and we might say, well, they failed. They struggled mightily. But I think the key is that there is continual fight and struggle and hatred for this. I'm not at all minimizing, I'm not at all saying just yay addictions and it, 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 there's no hope. What I am saying is very realistically and pastorally, and I've, I've seen this before, that you do see people who, who don't get out of the spiral as much as you'd like them, 
But what I'm looking for then as, as a pastor, even when I say, you know what, this one, like Jacob, is going to walk with quite a severe limp for the rest of his or her life. I'm looking for some fight. That's what I'm looking for. They, they haven't given up. They haven't just said, forget it. This is who I am. This is what I do. There's a continual hatred. I think the fact that Jesus talks about forgiving your brother 70 times 7, maybe it's hyperbolic language, but it certainly suggests that people may sin against you often, and you may sin against God the same way often. And that's why the Lord's Prayer instructs us not only to ask daily for bread, but I think by implication daily for repentance. So there, there, there may be some habits that we don't break in the way that we would like. And I think the, the only way to break them, there, there's just no secret to it. It's, it's in fellowship. It's attending to the means of grace. It's uh, praying with other Christians. It's reading your Bible. It's singing hymns. It's not losing hope. It's asking people to pray for you when you don't feel like you have any prayers left. Um, it's a long obedience in the same direction, and it's realizing that sometimes Christians take four steps back before they take five steps forward, and they take three steps back, and then go a little forward, and you just look at your life and see some, some trajectory towards holiness. Thank you. Um, someone, else asks, someone else asks, how do you stop yourself being lazy in your approach to holiness? And I'll couple with that, um, some people may be <coughs> tonight thinking to themselves, this is the first time I've thought seriously about this, but I, I feel the vitality that you were talking about. Where do I start? If someone's being lazy, someone just wants to start, how to, how to go about that? Yeah, that's great if, if that's where you are. I, I think you start with one thing, and you start with one simple thing, and that simple thing may be, uh, I, I'm not in God's word like I, like, like I want to be, and don't do what I have a tendency to do I've always had a tendency to do, okay, that was good, so I'm stirred up. You know what I'm going to do? I'm memorizing the New Testament. <laughs> and then the Old Testament. And I'm reading through the Bible this week. And I think it's much better to have a consistent, good, thoughtful seven minutes in the Word than 70 minutes every three weeks and then sort of feeling terrible about it. Um, and just a practical suggestion... Uh, maybe it's just sanctified common sense. I read a book a few years ago on habits. It's a non-Christian book. Uh, I thought one of the good takeaways was there is often in our life a, a keystone habit. That is, if there was one, working on one habit can often be the, the entryway to a lot of other good habits. And so in the book, and it's not a Christian book, it's talking about a woman and smoking and how that led to all sorts of bad habits. I think, um, for me, I think just going to bed on time. If I go to bed on time, I get up on time. If I get up on time, I have time to be in God's word, time to do that. I'm more patient when my kids... It's amazing. You're more patient if you get up before your kids and then if they jump on you and that's how you get up out of bed. So I think sometimes, you know, again, that, that's nothing particularly spiritual, but you may look at... I want, there may be a, a habit that could have to do with sleep. We neglect that. Could have to do with eating could have to do with any number of habits. And if you look at your life and you think, I'm just a whole mess and I'm just lazy and i got to fix 20 things, don't do that. Think, is, is there one thing that God would have me address this week that maybe I can make some progress in? Someone asks, to what extent should our pursuit of godliness be a corporate exercise? I guess they mean all of us involved in it together. It should, absolutely. That's, you know, most of us are, are probably prone to to individualism, and we're prone to hear this and think this is about me and my quiet time. So absolutely, it involves other people. It involves uh, not just the usual you know, accountability relationships with other people, but it involves the going to church, the, the discipline of sitting under God's word, of being in fellowship. There is no Lone Ranger Christianity. You need other Christians to uh, give you that assurance when you're weak. You need other Christians to rebuke you when you're wandering. Uh, I have never met a Christian who wanders away from the local church and it means greater spiritual maturity for him or her. It, it just doesn't. It needs to be corporate. Um, last two questions. 
Uh, someone asks, what's the role of prayer in drawing in God's strength to deliver from temptations or the lure of sin? In Luke 18, Jesus tells a parable about the persistent widow to the effect that we should pray and not give up. Uh, so Jesus, in Mark 1, it's amazing, he's healing people all through the night, his first day of public ministry in Capernaum, and Peter goes to find him the next day, and he finds him out in desolate place praying, which has always been encouraging and a rebuke to me, because I think if, if I were in Jesus' shoes, I'd think, or just Peter, I'd say, Jesus, you got really bang up ministry going on. Like, you just touch people and they heal. What, can you just wait five, just five more minutes you could heal? You know, 10 more people? Wouldn't that be good, Jesus? And, and, and Jesus broke away and he prayed. No one will be more effective in ministry than Jesus. And Jesus just said, all right, I'm not healing any more people tonight. <laughs> How do you do that? And then just walk away. So if, if Jesus in, as a human had, had limits, so, so did we. Uh, so do we. And when we don't pray, and when we get so busy that we don't pray, I think fundamentally it's, it's a measure of unbelief. It's unbelief that God is hearing us, that, that prayer actually matters. And it's, it's to disbelieve in our own finitude. Uh, when we don't rest, when we don't sleep, when we don't pray, we're believing the lie that we're indispensable and that we're infinite. Because to do those other things is to have to embrace that we have limitations, we have restraints, we can't do everything. And so prayer is both essential to growing in holiness and it is a mark of growing in holiness. Thank you very much. Okay, last question. Uh, in pursuing holiness, how can we cause ourselves to be genuinely excited about seeing the Lord, especially if he seems dis distant or disengaged from our affairs? You talked about that promise of seeing the Lord. How do you stimulate that excitement? Read the Gospels and see Jesus. And perhaps we have uh, you know, a, a view of God that is, is not biblically informed, or perhaps we, you know, when you think of heaven as holy, you think of just angels floating around playing their harps, just, you know, bringing you boring books to read and <laughs> hymns to sing in four-part harmony, and you're not into that sort of thing. I, I, I love to preach, I think most of all, from the Gospels. You get such a clear picture of, of Jesus. And, and I think if you're born again, um, the picture of Jesus stirs you, it frightens you, it amazes you, mesmerizes you. There's something magnetic about this, this God in human flesh. And I know no better way to stir up our affections than that. And I'll just finish with, uh, and I'll just borrow an illustration, one more from, that I heard from John Piper. He asked very provocatively, you know, if you think about heaven, and if somebody told you, you could go to heaven and you could have all your friends there, all your parents, you know, all your loved ones, maybe you don't want your parents there, but you have all your friends, all the people you love there. You could eat all the chocolate you wanted, not gain any weight. You could, you could have sex there. You could watch your football team. You could have all of that in heaven, okay? And Jesus isn't there. Do you still want it? Wow, that, that does sort of cut you low. Because that sounds pretty good. Now, of course, part of what we love in Jesus is he wipes away every tear and he satisfies our desires. It's not absent from, it's not in a vacuum from all other good gifts. But I think as a Christian, to focus on Jesus, to look at Jesus, to study Jesus, and in that there should be percolating this desire. Here's, never spoke a man like this before. And I, I, I want to see him. I, I want to... <laughs> I want to give him a hug. Or you Brits can shake his hand or something. <laughs> but I just, I just want to be with him. Um, Kevin, thank you so much. I'm going to ask you to lead us in, in a prayer in a moment. So let me just say, though, as we, as we draw to a close, uh, obviously head to the bookstore, grab any one of those books, they'll help you. But if tonight you, you just feel that vitality, that desire, or perhaps a sense of conviction, something going on in your life at the moment, don't miss this opportunity. Find someone else, a godly friend you can talk to and pray through these things with. Bring the gospel to bear on your life and pursue holiness. Kevin, you lead us in prayer.
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, it is such a privilege that we can come together. It is an amazing thing that here in the middle of London there are 500 mostly people younger than myself who are here on a Sunday night to sing and to praise, to pray, to listen, to grow. Lord, would you speak to each of them and give them just what they need? Some may need to bow the knee to Christ for the first time. Would you help them as they contemplate that? Some need to be brought back on the path they've been wandering. Give them the right grace, the right severity, and the right kindness. And there are others who are walking and they need to know that you're pleased, that you love them, that you, you've not left them, you've not forgotten them. Would you do just that? Would you stir up in this place a holy hunger for Christ, for his cross, for the gospel, for grace, for godliness, for mission, for love and service? And we pray that you would do more than we even know how to ask or imagine according to the work that is at work within us. To him be glory now and forever. Amen. 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 Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.